In 1965, two University of Pennsylvania psychology graduate students by the name of Martin Seligman and Stephen F. Meyer carried out an experiment, although highly unethical, on a group of dogs. Martin divided them into three groups, and when he rang his bell, he zapped them with electricity. Some could escape the shocks by releasing themselves from harnesses, other dogs could hit a lever, whilst other dogs weren't given a way out. And when the conditioning was complete, Seligman moved to the second phase of the experiment. The group of dogs that had no way of escaping the shocks were placed with the other two groups of dogs that could escape. Now, in this new box, the dogs could escape the shocks by simply jumping over a short wall to the other side of the box that was free of zaps. Interestingly, the dogs that were given the chance to escape in the previous experiment did indeed jump over the wall and evaded the pain, whilst the dogs that were not previously given an escape path surrendered to the shocks, barking in pain and passively waited for the shocks to cease. Due to their previous experience, they had developed a cognitive expectation that nothing they did would prevent or eliminate the shocks. This learned behavior, the belief that no matter what they did, they could not change their circumstance, was what Seligman termed learned helplessness or acquired despair. Similarly, in India, when elephant trainers catch a baby elephant, they tie its foot to a post, causing it to struggle for days in attempt to break free till it gives up when it learns that it's useless. In its later years, when that elephant grows to its full size, nevertheless, it does not attempt to break free, despite being strong enough to do so, and instead passively awaits the trainer to set it free because its mind has been broken and has learned that it is helpless. Helplessness is deeper than sadness. It is the belief that there is nothing that can be done to improve a bad situation that relates to you or others. Learned helplessness or acquired despair can affect individuals, communities, and nations at large. Similar to what befell the Muslims during the Mongol invasion, fear had gripped people in such a way that a Mongol soldier would enter upon a congregation and instruct them to wait, not to move from their places, till he goes out and finds a suitable rock to crush their heads. And they, in utter helplessness, would await their executor to arrive, to then slay them one by one without any resistance. Clearly, therefore, learned helplessness is not so much the product of the dramatic event itself, but more so the manner in which it is interpreted and reacted to. Those who interpret the pain of a particular happening in light of similar past experiences will plummet into a cycle of self-defeatist thinking because they've convinced themselves that the pain is simply unavoidable and that they have no control over the situation and so they don't even try. Those, however, who interpret the pain as an opportunity for growth and success will remain motivated to overcome the challenge. So what then do you make of a person, a Muslim, who considers worldly pains as his pathway to paradise? So it's not the event that brings about helplessness, it's the interpretation of that event and how it is reacted to. When the coalition of pagans, an army of 10,000 men which was arguably larger than the entire population of Medina, arrived at the city of Medina intending to put an end to the Muslim presence once and for all, one would expect a total meltdown in the Muslim midst and a prompt surrender. So intense was the hour that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said depicting the trial, هُنَالِكَ بِتُلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا There, the believers were tested and shaken with a severe shaking. And above and Beyond the military mobilization, there was another mobilization that was just as threatening to the Muslims, the psychological warfare employed by the hypocrites to demoralize the Muslims. One which the Quran exposed, saying, وَإِذْ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ مَّا وَعَدَنَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا And when the hypocrites and those in whose hearts is disease, they said, Allah and His Messenger did not promise us except delusion. The Muslims' reaction, however, was to their enemies completely baffling. 
they viewed the realities that were unfolding before them through a lens of breathtaking positivity. Allah said, When the believers saw the enemy alliance, They said, This is what Allah and His Messenger have promised us. And the promise of Allah and His Messenger has come true. And this only increased them in faith and submission. And with this stubborn insistence to not surrender to helplessness, along with the human means that they exhausted to the best of their limited ability and above all their reliance upon Allah, the divine intervention arrived. As it always does, Allah drove back the disbelievers in their rage totally empty-handed. And Allah spared the believers from fighting. So once again, it's not the event itself that brings helplessness. No, it's the way in which it is interpreted and reacted to. The learned helplessness concept helps explain many unfortunate happenings that affect the Muslims. A person who gives up on his arduously long search for marriage and in utter agitation chooses to fornicate. Or a businessman who, due to mounting pressure from family or friends or the market, cave in and reintroduce alcohol to their shops. Or those who insist that there's no point in Muslims being part of politics because of previous failures. Or those who water down their religious beliefs to appease others in society or an employer or their likes. Or those who give up on planning for their ummah or the pursuing of an Islamic vision because they say what's the point the Freemasons control it all and so on and on all of these examples as well as others they all have one matter in common they interpreted an event in a negative way and they convinced themselves that their actions are inconsequential and so they gave up Moving forward, what do we do from here? A former Soviet KGB propaganda agent by the name of Yuri Bezmenov describes the process of national subversion used by the USSR on international targets, which he calls the four stages of ideological subversion. He says in order they are number one, demoralization, number two, destabilization, number three, create a crisis, number four, normalization. So the intended result of normalizing relations with your enemy, whereby they now see you as your friend, according to Yuri Bezmenov, begins with a process of demoralization. What is even more interesting is his suggestion for how a society may resist such subversion. He said the most difficult and at the same time the simplest answer to the subversion is to start at the process of demoralization. And even before, he said, it's to bring the society back to religion. Indeed, ours is a religion that resists despair in the harshest expressions no one loses hope in Allah's mercy except the disbelieving people because of its disastrous effects in sedating people from trying again no surprise that the scholars have classified despair as one of the major sins being worse than that of using interest theft and fornication in fact in his book Al-Kaba'ir the major sins, Imam al-Dhahabi lists the sin of despair only second place to associating partners with Allah. The obligation of healing the injured morale of the Muslim Ummah is not the sole responsibility of scholars and activists and students of knowledge, but the responsibility of every person who calls himself a Muslim. Put an end to all pessimistic conversations. Put an end to endless blaming and criticizing of others. Put an end to the witch hunt of people's faults and futile discussions which have proven to be useless and time-wasting and very unconstructive. Instead, work towards your personal revival and the revival of your ummah. And the very first key to unlocking this achievement lies in three simple words. Change your thoughts. And for those who want a practical demonstration of someone who did this astoundingly well, let us rewind to the tragic battle of Uhud. At first, the battle had seemingly ended before it had a chance to start. The pagans, despite outnumbering the Muslims by three to one, fled the battlefield in terror as the Muslims fought with so much courage. And when it seemed that the dust had settled in favor of the believers, a minority of the companions made a costly strategic mistake to the detriment of 70 Muslim lives. 
including the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and to the detriment of the outcome of the battle. So dire was the situation that news even spread on the battlefield that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had met his fate. And here, a hero of a companion, Anas ibn Nadr, approached an assembly of disheartened Muslims who had dropped their weaponry and sat on the ground in hopelessness. He asked them, "Why you sat here?" They responded, "The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has died." And he responded, "What do you intend to do with your lives after him? Why don't you get up and die for the same cause that he died for?" And here, Anas ibn Nadr advanced single-handedly towards the pagan forces as he called upon Allah, saying, "Allahu." Oh Allah, I apologize to you for what these have done, pointing to his friends. And I free myself from what these have done, pointing to the pagans. On his way to the front lines, he was met by Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, another giant of a companion. And let us hear the conversation that took place between these two giants of Islam. Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, he said to Anas ibn Nadr, O oh father of Amr, where are you going? Anas ibn Nadr, he replied, How beautiful is the fragrance of paradise. I can smell it and it's emanating from near Mount Uhud. Sa'd ibn Mu'ad was relating this incident to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the battle. And here Sa'd ibn Mu'ad, he said to the Prophet, O oh Messenger of Allah, I was simply unable to do what he did on that day. If Sa'd ibn Mu'ad is saying this, Sa'd ibn Mu'ad, the companion whose death would cause the throne of of Allah to shake and whose funeral procession was attended by 70,000 angels if he is saying that he was unable to follow the footsteps of Anas ibn Nadr during that day then I leave it to your imagination to think about what Anas must have done on the day of Uhud. Post battle Anas ibn Nadr was missing. They found a corpse next to Mount Uhud that was severely mutilated and had received over 80 wounds rendering it completely unrecognizable. A lady called Ar-Rabi'a bin Nadr inspected the corpse and from his fingertips she learned that it was her brother Anas. And after this Allah Almighty revealed a verse from the Quran commenting on this episode where Allah said مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَاهَدُوا اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ Among the believers are men who were true to what they had promised Allah. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهُ Among them is he who has fulfilled his promise. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرْ And among them is he who awaits his chance. وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا And they did not change in the least. Notice here how the very same event, the alleged death of the Prophet wasallam, that caused some to fall onto the ground in despair, was the very same event that caused Anas to advance enthusiastically towards his martyrdom. This is therefore the clearest evidence that the real problem is not in a given event that may be affecting you or your family or your ummah at large. No, regardless of how painful that event may be, the real issue and challenge is in the way in which we choose to interpret it and how we react and the decisions we subsequently make. The same tragedy that causes some to crumble in despair is the very same tragedy that others will view as a vehicle to paradise. So your situation can be changed. And the situation of the Ummah at large will be changed. But it starts by changing your thoughts. Because what we did not mention earlier is that according to Martin Seligman himself, learned helplessness or acquired despair can in fact be unlearned. And it starts by changing your thoughts on an event, which will in turn change your feelings towards it. And then your actions. And as a Muslim, no human being on Allah's earth has greater reasons and tools to do all of this than you.